So, today we're going to talk a little bit about MERB and why it may be cool or why it may not be cool. My name is Ezra Zygmuntovich. I work at Engine Yard. We build clusters and stuff. Louder? Yeah. Okay. We're gonna, I'm going to go through a couple of the guiding principles of MERB development and then we're going to take a look at some of the more advanced features. So, one of the main goals here is to prefer simplicity over magic as much as possible. Simple code runs better, it's easier for other people to understand, and when you're building framework style code that lots of other people are going to use, you really need to keep this in mind. Uh, so, you know, none of this really special tricks, symbol to proc, returning, alias method chain, all this kind of stuff I don't believe belongs in framework code. It's fine in your own application because you're in control of it, but if you're going to make this big ball of code and hand it to other people to build on top of, you need to make it pretty sane. Uh, when in doubt, benchmark and profile. Like, you know, MERB is fast, and it's fast because I haven't made just like random assumptions about how Ruby works. I've actually benchmarked and profiled, and you can't really get performance numbers better without doing this, because you're almost always going to be wrong if you're guessing at what's taking the time in your program. Another big important issue is knowing your runtime and how it acts. Like Ruby is a real complex beast, and so there's all kinds of little corners of the language that you might not expect. So uh, I like to, I have like a, a little folder on my on my Mac here where I keep all kinds of little little you know little idioms you can do in Ruby a number of different ways and like a benchmark of them all so you kind of can get a picture. Can we get that put on the web somewhere? Yeah, I, I'll put it up on my blog after this. And then there's, there's some of them, simple benchmarks in the, in the MERB core uh, Git repository as well, you can see. So this is my big motto. No code is faster than no code. Tom kind of stole my thunder on that one already. But, <laughs> you know, if you keep, if you just have as little code as possible, it's going to execute faster than some big behemoth monster, you know, monument to personal cleverness. So let's talk about why MERB. You know, we're all hackers here. MERB's all about no sausage. Like, you should be able to go look in your framework and figure stuff out and hack it to, to bend it to your will. Uh, a framework should not, in my opinion, be a black box that people never go spelunking in because it's scary. Also, a big factor is don't leave any broken windows. Like, if you, you know, as a, as a project gains momentum, there's all kinds of people committing to it, you're getting more and more code in there. You know, if you start to leave little things that annoy you or little, little parts of the code base that, you know, could be cleaner or need to be tested better or, or whatever, that builds up and you build a debt and anybody else working on the project ends up going, oh, well, it's kind of janky over here, so I don't mind if my code is janky too, right? You got to... So MERB is all about web services. This was kind of what I originally wrote it to deal with is you know, file upload services, little REST servlets, all kinds of different services. A lot of people using MERB in production right now have, you know, their main app, their main UI tier is in a Rails app, and they have MERB services on the back end that do certain things, and it's, uh, MERB's really efficient at making small memory footprint servlets, so you can have a lot of them doing different things. Um, this example here, hopefully the code's big enough, this is uh, MERB's provides API which is a bit, kind of a different take on the respond to format thing that's in Rails. So in your controller, you can declare that this post controller provides JSON, YAML, and XML, and all controllers provide HTML by default. So what happens here is, up at the top, we're, regist we're registering MIME types. So for a YAML MIME type, which will be, if the accept headers come in as application X YAML or text YAML, then, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. See how we're, we're finding a post, and we say display post, and that's based on what we, the MIME types we provided. So when a request comes in, say for YAML, <coughs> with the accept header set to what's in the top line of the YAML, we're going to display post, we'll call to YAML on the post object. Same thing for XML or JSON or whatever. So it's just a nice, simpler way to declare that this controller provides these formats, and based on the accept header, will automatically call the right to whatever method on your post object. So this is pretty clean. 
cleans up a lot of the, the, the code that you do with response format. And uh, another cool feature of Merb is we use parse tree and Ruby to Ruby on server boot to walk all of your controller classes and any methods they mix in for modules or whatever, look at what arguments they have. Like if you'll notice this action takes an ID parameter. So rather than just having the magic params hash that would have params ID or params user or whatever in it, you still have access to that. But you can define your actions, you know, every show action usually just looks at params ID. So here instead, what happens is on server boot, we walk all your controllers, find out all the arguments to their methods and their default values and memoize that away in a hash. So when we're doing a dispatch uh, for this post show action, Merb will know that it takes an ID parameter and it will stuff the ID in there out of, the, out of the, either the query string or the post body or whatever. So just a little bit different ways of doing things. It makes, tends to make things a little bit more Ruby-ish in my, in my opinion. And another thing about Merb is the return value from your actions is what gets sent to the client. So there is no auto render. You're always gonna have to call render or display or like you can just return a string and that string will get sent back to the client. Or you can return an open IO handle and that will get streamed to the client. Or you can return a proc object that takes the response and then you can directly write to the response and do a bunch of other stuff that uh, you might have trouble doing uh, if you didn't have such direct access. There's a bunch, the returning a proc kind of ties into this next stuff. There's a bunch of advanced streaming technology in Merb. Like, this is a simple example of tail, like you could run this Merb app and watch Merb tail its own logs. So this is a render chunked function that basically uses a transfer encoding chunked to send, could keep the connection to the client open and send little chunks down the stream. So we call render chunked, we IOP open the log file and then we get a line and we send it down, and that can, that'll keep the stream open and just allow you to stream chunks. Oh, that works pretty well for doing you know, Ajax progress uploads. You can st stream chunks of JavaScript down to an if frame and have them execute when they hit. Uh, another advanced streaming technique, a lot of people are using S3 these days for file stores. And if you have, say, a file on S3, that is private that you need to authenticate to get, but you want to use your Merb application to authenticate the user first before you let them download the file. What this stream file method will let you do is user hits your site requesting the file, you authenticate them through your normal standard authentication mechanism, and then we call this stream file method, tell it the file name, the type, and the content length, uh, and that yields a response to the block, and then we can open uh, an AWS S3 object stream, and then that'll, each chunk that comes down from S3, we can write it directly to the response. So what that means is you could have a Merb app as a proxy between your client and S3, authenticate in the middle, but when the download starts, it streams directly through Merb all the way to the client, rather than you know, waiting for the download from S3 to hit your server and fully finish, and then start downloading the client. So it makes a big difference for any kind of streaming stuff you need to do. It's very flexible. Uh, Merv is all based on Rack, which is a, a web server extraction library, kind of like ModWizGy for Python. And it basically distills a web request down into a proc, or any Ruby object that has a call method that takes an environment hash. And the environment hash contains all the standard CGI headers, and it contains the body IO stream if there's a post body on the request. So with this abstraction layer, we get to have the same code run on any of these web servers. And this is a simple example of a proc that could be a web app. Basically, with Rack, you have anything that responds to call that takes an environment argument, and then you return a tuple, with a three-element array of the status code, a hash of the headers to send, and then the string of the body. Or if it's not a string, anything that responds to each and yields strings. So this is a very simple example of a rack application that returns a 200 OK content type text XML and then just sends back the inspected uh, CGI headers. About as simple as you can get. Uh, in all Merb applications, if you look, there's a config rack.rb file that just has a simple one line uh, run Merb rack, rack application new. And what this does is this sets up the Merb rack application that has its call method that does all the dispatching into the Merb code, and it's, it's simple. That's what uh, 
this is the default scenario. But if you have some more complex things you want to do, uh, having rack like exposed like this in your Merb app is really powerful. So this is a kind of a trivial, simple example. Say we have some kind of API in our application for XML or for RSS feeds or for JSON like this. And it's, you know, it's a significant amount of our traffic. It doesn't require any of the UI tier of Merb or anything. So we can just stick this little API handler in front of the Merb rack application and any requests that come in. Uh, so here's what we're doing. We've got this API handler. When you initialize it, it takes an, a rack application, which is our Merb rack application. And when you call it, it sets up a request object, checks the path against API star, and then if, it if the path matches, it returns 200, OK, content type text JSON, and then calls our API get JSON on the match from the request URI. Uh, and if it doesn't match the path, it falls back and calls our Merb Rack application with the environment. And so Rack has an idea of middleware and a bunch of different handlers and stuff. So if you look at the bottom here where it says, use API handler, run Merb Rack application new, what that does is it automatically instantiates the API handler with an instance of the Merb Rack that you ran and then sets that up as the default environment to be called on a request. So it's basically wrapping a request in another simple API. There's a bunch of other cool stuff you can do with this. There's like a rack cascade, which you can say here, here's a, an array of rack applications to try, and the first one that returns a non-404 gets sent to the client. So you could have you know, multiple applications in the same process and have a try on each one until it finds one it likes. There's also a bunch of middleware for doing pretty stack traces and logging. Uh, Merv has one that you can wrap a profiler around your request so that with the middleware. So in development mode, you could wrap a profiler around it and have it output profiling information for you. Uh, a bunch of really useful stuff. And basically what this does that I like a lot is you, know, you can have the full power of Merb for building anything that needs UI or that provides API or, or whatever part of your application, but you can get really close to the metal when you need to have some kind of small API handler or something that needs to be really, really fast. Um, going to talk about web servers for a couple minutes. Uh, Mongrel has kind of been the standard thing that everybody runs their Rails and Merv applications on. It's rock solid stable. It's a threaded server, uh, which means that every request that comes in spawns a new thread. Uh, there's a bunch of new servers like Thin and Ebb uh, that people are, are working hard on that are event-driven servers. Thin uses Event Machine and Ebb uses LibEV. And they're both rack-based servers, so they dispatch rack, re rack requests. Uh, the event-driven servers are, are quite a bit faster than Mongrel, but they have a downside in that if you have like slow actions or you have a file upload that does a bunch of our magic calls or whatever, while that's running, you basically block the event loop, and so no other, no other request can get served. So they're really fast if you have a well-behaved application with no, no long actions, but as soon as you have intermixed long actions in there, they start to fall down and the, and the response times go way, way down. Threaded servers aren't like as fast by default as event-driven servers, but they won't fall down when there's long requests because each request is running its own thread. Um, I worked with the author of Ebb and Thin to get a, uh, a, new, a, a new API put into their rack handlers. So on your rack application, our Merb rack application, you can define a deferred question mark uh, method that takes the environment and lets the framework figure out if you're going to have a long request or not, and if it's a long request, you can spawn a thread. So basically what this does is in your initRB in your Merb app, you set a couple of regexes for actions you know are going to be slow, like a file upload or some long ass action or whatever. And when, Merb, when the dispatch comes through, if it's one of these actions matches, it gets spawned in a thread. If not, it's just standard event-driven style. So what this does is allows you to get on the event-driven servers to utilize their much better performance, but also not have them kind of fall on their ass when you have long requests. So this kind of gives you the best of both worlds, uh, and it's pretty sweet. Uh, Merv has a, a bunch of since you can return a proc from your actions in Merb and have it like, get called later, there's a bunch of cool stuff that sets up for us, uh, deferred callables. So Merb has a method called render deferred, where what, what it does is it'll, it allows you to set up a proc and then kind of 
drop that out of your action and return so that the server can go on to serve the next request. And what will happen is Mongrel or whichever server you're using will call this, this block later. So we say, you know, say we were doing an RS feed and we're wrapping it up nicely uh, or something. So we take an URL in on our action, we parse it with URI parse, and then we say render deferred, you know, make this net HTTP get request out to get the RSS feed and return it wrapped in our RSS pretty print. And everything inside of the render deferred block will not be called until after the action returns and other actions can come through and get dispatched. So what this allows you to do, since maybe it'll take a while to get this URL, you kind of drop this proc out of the action so it can continue to process other actions and this thing will, in the background thread, go out and make the request and bring it back and print it back to that client without blocking other clients from getting through. Um, we've also got uh, render then call. And what this does is just what it sounds like. It allows you to render your response to the client and close the client's connection so they're done and they get the response already. And then it calls the block after that finishes. So say you have you know, this ping action where somebody posts an URL and you're supposed to ping it, but they don't care about the return value. They just want you to ping it, like for a track back or something. So what you do is you render then call, and this is going to re return you know, got ping for the URL uh, back to the client. And then the, recli the client's done. They got their response back. And then in the background thread, Merb is going to go ahead and ping the, uh, the URL for you. So you know, this isn't a general replacement for like a messaging queue or some kind of background daemon. Uh, but it's really helpful for small things, like if you have some action you need to call out to another web service or you need to do some calculation, or you need to do something that takes five or 10 seconds, and you don't want to block the request loop. You can just drop this out and have it go in a background thread. Uh, Merb's got a really powerful router. It's, it does about 95% of the stuff Rails router does for RESTful resources. You can have nested resources, namespaces, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and you get a nice helper to regenerate these. And they work basically very similar to how Rails works, so that you can have a uh, active resource compatible little servlets that are much res less resource intensive than a Rails app. Uh, but it actually goes quite a bit further than that as far as the power you get. So if we take a look, you know, if we have up here, we've got a post resource, which is like a RESTful controller. But if we look at this top one here, we can say, okay, when the request comes in and it matches this post regex, and the user agent is mobile Safari, then we're going to go to the iPhone post controller instead of the normal post controller. And you can see here where in the post we capture uh, whatever comes after post in the URL in a regex. And then if you look at title, we've got a little bracket one which says take the, no, the first match from the regex and fill this in so we'll get the title coming into our action. So this is an easy way to, say, have an iPhone controller for uh, some request coming in from an iPhone and have it dispatched at the, router at the router layer rather than having to do it in your own controller. And then we've also got deferred routes, which are even more powerful. And what these do is, if the route matches this first part, we say defer to, we pass in the request object and the params hash. And then you can do any arbitrary logic you want in here. Like here, I'm looking up a subdomain uh, out of the database uh, and then returning the, whichever controller the subdomain account says is the admin controller and whichever action the subdomain says is an action from the token from the, from the route. So what this basically does is it allows you to do any arbitrary Ruby code as part of a, a route matching. And if it does match, you just return a hash that has to have at least a controller key in it. The action, if you leave it out, will be index, and any other params that you want to return back that will show up in the params hash. And if it doesn't match, like if, this, if the subdomain isn't found, then it just returns nil or false, and what that does is it tells the router, okay, well that deferred route didn't match, so let's go on to the next one and keep trying from there. So it allows you to inject arbitrary code at any point in your route matching uh, and go from there. So it's, it allows for really flexible routes. Um, if you want to contribute, 
There is uh, the MERB core up on GitHub and Lighthouse. We've got an IRC channel, Google Groups. And we just have a new wiki up at wiki.mervivore.com that is written in MERB uh, that's starting to get quite a bit of, of nice stuff on there. And we use uh, Defensio, which is kind of like a kismet spam protection. Turns out those guys are all written on MERB. And so they donated some accounts to us to keep spam off the wiki, which has worked pretty really well so far. Uh, one more thing here. So MERB is heavily inspired by Rails. Uh, that's pretty obvious. And I've you know, kind of taken it as a chance to re-architect how, how a Rails-like framework works. Uh, so this last week, I spent, I've spent the whole week kind of porting some of the cool stuff from MERB back into Rails specifically all the rack machinery. Uh, so now, it's, it's still on my GitHub fork of Rails, but it will, it will eventually get pushed back into, into Rails itself. But I've ported all the rack adapters in here and added a script rack up script to a freshly generated Rails application. So this, what this does now is it allows us to use any of the web servers that rack supports, but standardize command line for daemonizing and clustering and all that kind of stuff. So here we can say script rack up dash a thin, which means use a thin adapter and it will boot up. We could say script rack up a thin dash c 10. It'll start a cluster of 10 servers uh, with PID files and all that kind of good stuff. So this is, uh, this is a work in progress, but while I was digging through the, the rail source there in action pack, Change logs say it hasn't been touched in like 20 months or something, and it kind of kind of shows it's it's grown quite a bit of cruft in there. And it took me a while to trace down how a request goes through Action Pack from the web server and everything. And it turns out that this is what what it was doing when I first started investigating it. Is you get a raw request from your web server that comes in that gets wrapped in a rack environment that should be rack E and V, not E and D, which is the header hash and the, and the uh, request body. That got wrapped in a rack request object that then got wrapped in a CGI wrapper object that finally got wrapped in a CGI request object all before you get the request object in your Rails controller. And at each step along the way, it was like duping the CGI headers. So I don't know if anybody's ever done a, an inspect on the request object from the Rails app and you get a dump that's like this long. It's because there's like five layers of abstraction there and they're duping the headers along the way. So I was able to trim that down to just be the raw request, comes in as a rack environment and gets wrapped in the final action controller rack request that you get in your controllers. And it doesn't dupe the headers anymore. Uh, so it's actually fairly, a, little good, a pretty good little memory saving because on every request to every Rails app, they're duping this big set of headers uh, for no reason. And so that's a lot of extra garbage for the garbage collector to work on. Uh, so getting rid of that stuff is pretty, is, is pretty good. I've also been able to rearrange the way Rails does its mutex lock. Like before, what it would do, would, a request would come in, it would lock the mutex, it would run the dispatcher callbacks, it would recognize the routes, it would instantiate the controller and then call the action and, uh, and then do the after dispatch hooks. And that was all with inside the lock. Uh, and I've changed it so that the only thing that's inside the lock is the dispatch to the controller. So uh, dispatcher hooks, routing recognition, controller instantiation are all happen outside the lock in a thread safe way. And this is nice. It actually it doesn't make Rails thread safe, but it makes it perform quite a bit better under heavy load because there's quite a, few, there's quite a smaller lock now. Uh, so I think these are some pretty big wins for Rails and it shows, shows how you can uh, you know, really approach a problem from a different angle if you step back and rewrite it from scratch. Uh, but it's also kind of cool to put this stuff back in Rails, I think, and because Rails is, you know, it's a dominant platform. Everybody uses it, uh, pays my wages and everything. So I, I'd like to make Rails quite a bit better. So I'm going to be spending the next couple of weeks working on heavily working on refactoring Action Pack and getting a bunch of that stuff cleaned up that hasn't been touched in so long. So. Anybody qu got questions? Two things.
Two things. So I know I asked you this over lunch, but just so that everyone can hear, does this mean that uh, Rails running under Rack doesn't use CGI.RB for parameter parsing anymore? It still does in my current branch of it, but it won't after, for after a couple more days or whatever. Which is um, awesome. A uh, second yeah. thing, um, just quickly, instead of, uh, I don't know if everyone knows that you can just, instead of, if you are using S3, instead of uh, streaming like you suggested, well, that's definitely better than downloading and then serving it up again. Um, you can use S3's uh, query string authentication to just set up a redirect to a one-time URL and let Amazon do all the serving for you. Sure. Yeah, that's just an example. There's a whole number of other cases where you want to, you know, grab a URL and only stream chunks rather than waiting for the whole stuff to come down. So, anybody else? Hi, um, I have a question for you about performance. Uh, it seems that whenever I ask anyone who's in the position of actually having a, a, a Rails app in production about performance, they always say memcache, memcache, memcache. Mm -hmm. And um, I, uh, right now I'm dealing with, and can imagine dealing with again in, in, the, in the future, uh, problems where, uh, where maybe an application involves many users and um, with my Java head and I think, well, that's okay, I'll just keep this stuff in memory and you know, keep it around in a cache. Right. In process, which is different than a memcache model. Yeah. Does, does Merb have any answers or opinion on that question? And It's not a hugely different picture than how it works in Rails. You're still going to want to use memcache if you're using multiple processes. But since Merb is thread safe and can run without a lock if you don't use active record, then you can get a lot more out of one process. Uh, and th so that way, if you, you know, if you just have something smaller, you know, even to medium size that you need to have some kind of servlet for, Merv could probably do that without, without needing multiple processes so you could keep a cache right in memory. But it's, you know, it's still Ruby green threading at this point. So maybe JRuby and Rubinius eventually will fix that with some native threads and then we'll have true parallel thread execution. But for now, yeah, you're still going to need memcache pretty much or something similar. Thank you. Yeah. How, how long could you expect to have a MERB process running under like Thin or Mongrel or something like that? How long? Yeah, before it leaks out. Uh, it depends. Like if you're, you know, if you haven't written any code that leaks yourself, then MERB doesn't leak. And I've seen MERB daemons running for months and months. Well, the, the, the VM though leaks back to the OS. So like, I mean, what's, what's the, I mean, I know you run a lot of these processes, right? So what's the feasible limit on like how long it depends. Like I usually set you know set up and mon it to just watch the memory, and if the memory goes above a certain threshold, then restart. But Merb processes in on average restart a lot less than Rails processes do, because there's you know the framework is a lot less code. There's a lot less objects created on every request. There's a lot less work for the garbage collector, and that's one of the big performance issues with Rails is not. You know, not is the garbage collector in, in Matz's Ruby is kind of weak and. Rails creates a lot of garbage, so the GC can get called once or twice on a request sometimes, and that you know that takes a lot of time because it stops the world to collect garbage, and so by keeping the amount of garbage down, you can really uh, increase the life of a daemon and increase its stability. So, Uh, can you uh, give us a little bit of insight into which aspects of Action Pack or what other aspects of Rails you'll be looking at in the next couple of weeks? You said you're working on some more revisions. Can you give us a little preview of what kind of stuff you're looking to beat up? Yeah, so I plan on completely tearing out whoa, any dependencies on CGI.rb because uh, that's an old library that, that I hate um, and should just be gone. So. I'd expect the, all the parameter and form and upload processing to get much better in the Rails future. I also will probably be reworking the session implementation because right now it, require, it relies on CGI session, which is part of CGI RB. So I'd like to not even have that as a dependency anymore. So in general, uh, the main things I'm looking at is just make the dispatcher code path as quick and clean as possible, have all this rack stuff polished with one single abstraction for starting and clustering daemons of depend, no matter what kind of web server it is, and just a bunch of general refactoring inside of Action Pack. Uh, we'll see, I have some ideas for Action View as well. Uh, we'll see if I get to that right now or not. Um, and then there's also some work I like to do just to make Rails thread safe. It needs, 
basically we need a mode for Rails in production mode that can preload everything that you'll ever require so that, because the dependencies mechanism right now in Rails is not thread safe. If you had two threads running and one thread sees a missing constant foo and goes to try to load the file, the other file sees the same missing constant and tries to load it and they start stepping on each other. Uh, so I'd like to fix up and make like a preload, you know, preload my app mode that just goes through and loads everything before it ever dispatches a request. And just, there's probably just a, a bunch of general stuff in there that kind of needs to be touched up a bit. Uh, need to be really careful of all the class variables in there because those are really bad for thread safety. And in general, I'm just going to try and do a little cleanup and see what, how we can make it better. Thanks. Sure. All right, well, thanks, everyone. <laughs>